You're watching BBC News at Nine with me, Anita McVeigh. The headlines. Two years on from the Grenfell Tower fire, survivors and relatives of the 72 dead come together today to remember the tragedy. It's very hard to believe that it's happened. Um, even though you know and you've seen death certificates and everything else, it's, you find it very hard to accept. The latest figures show that hundreds of high-rise buildings still have cladding similar to the type used on Grenfell Tower. In other news, one of the Conservative leadership candidates, Matt Hancock, is considering quitting the contest as Boris Johnson's rivals put pressure on him to take... Hello, good morning and welcome to the BBC News at Nine. Memorial services and vigils are to be held throughout the day to mark the second anniversary of the Grenfell Tower fire in which 72 people died. Two years on from the disaster, three quarters of tall buildings with cladding categorised as unsafe still haven't had it removed or modified. The latest government figures suggest work hasn't yet started on more than half of those buildings, many of them privately owned. Out of 328 buildings in England that still have aluminium composite material cladding, 221 buildings are still waiting on work to start. These include private, social housing, student accommodation, hotels and public buildings. Well, let's cross now to the church where one of the memorial services will take place today. Our correspondent uh, Richard Galpin is there in Kensington in West London. Uh, Richard, first of all, on this second anniversary, tell us more about how the victims are being remembered? Well, it's going to be a day of remembrance. Um, as you're saying, it's obviously going to be an emotional time. The service here starts um, at 11 o'clock and at that service will be uh, survivors um, and those uh, who lost loved ones in the fire two years ago. There will be representatives uh, from the government, two government ministers will be here. Uh, the MP for Kensington will also be attending. But as I say, it's obviously going to be a very emotional time. Now, one person for whom it's particularly painful is a man called Nabil Chuker. Uh, he wasn't actually in the building at the time, but he lost six members of his family. And he's been talking to the BBC about why it's important to hold these anniversaries. It's, it's to make sure that they know never forgotten. It's also to, so that we all um, give our prayers to all the 72 members, get in the community all together um, and ensuring um, that we will stick by each other year after year until we get the justice and what we're looking for. And Richard, the relatives of the victims, the survivors, campaigners, part of their, their quest for justice is to make sure something like this can never happen again, which is why clearly they're very disturbed by these figures showing uh, that so many buildings still have this unsafe cladding and that in many cases work hasn't even begun to remove it. Yeah, I think these are really uh, shocking statistics which have now emerged. As you're saying, more than 200 buildings across England where work hasn't even started, and yet they have this very dangerous cladding uh, surrounding each of those buildings. So it's obviously um, of huge concern. Uh, the fire brigade has also been talking about uh, the issues. They've, they're launching a campaign saying there needs to be much greater fire safety and regulations brought in. So overall, I think that people will be very concerned uh, about this because also obviously uh, these buildings which still have the cladding you're talking about tens of thousands of people who are at risk inside those buildings okay richard thank you very much richard galpin in west london for us well a government spokesperson from the ministry of housing communities and local government has said there is nothing more important than supporting those affected by the grenfell tower tragedy and making sure the lessons are learned so this never happens again We've allocated £600 million for the removal and replacement of dangerous ACM cladding on high-rise homes and are working with councils to ensure this work is completed. Uh, for all residents of high-rise buildings, we are working to improve engagement between them 
and those managing their buildings, as well as providing more effective routes for escalation and redress when things go wrong. Well, let's talk now to the MP, John Healy, who's Labour's uh, Shadow Housing Secretary. Mr Healy, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, you said just a few days ago that many of the owners of the, the private tower blocks, and these are many of the blocks in question which haven't started work on removing that cladding, have shown, in your words, zero sign of replacing it. And you say ministers are letting them uh, drag their feet. I mean, is it really the case that they've shown zero sign of replacing it? Uh, because obviously there's been a row over who would pay. It is. Uh, two years on, nine out of ten of those high-rise blocks with private owners uh, still have the same Grenfell-style cladding on the side, and 70 of the block owners don't even have a plan in place to get the work done. So two years on, really, the government has got to get tough with these block owners. It needs to name those with the cladding on the side. It needs to set a tough deadline by the end of the year to get the work done. It needs to give councils stronger powers to be able to levy heavy fines and also take over these blocks where private owners won't do the work. And above all, it must overhaul the legislation now so that we have a building safety system for the future that gives people the confidence that a fire and a tragedy such as Grenfell can never happen again. So really, is the main thrust of your argument now that the government has said it will fully fund uh, the replacement of this aluminium composite material cladding on these high-rise private residential blocks? Is it all about putting pressure on those owners to really get on with that work and to, uh, I think you said, name and shame them if necessary? It is. The, the government have put some money aside for this work to be done. Um, but they've been urging these block owners to do the work for well over a year. And it's quite clear that too many are dragging their feet. And it's also quite clear that not just on this, but on every front, the action the government's taken since Grenfell has simply been too weak and too slow. And too little has changed over these two long years. There are still Grenfell families in temporary accommodation. There's still not even a first report from the public inquiry. We've got hundreds of buildings still with this unsafe cladding on the side and we've still not had this legislation to overhaul the building safety regulations and rules to make them fit for the future. So how does Labour's five-point plan to make these high-rise homes safe, how does that differ uh, from what the government has already done or is saying it will do? Because the government for two years has simply said to the private block owners, you have a moral duty to do this work and pay for it. They finally put forward a fund, which is not yet available and not yet open, to help the deal with the cost of that. But quite simply, these are block owners that, as I say, more than 70 have, don't even have a plan in place after two years. And the government's got to get tough. And only the government can make sure this recladding work is done. Only the government can get the survivors, all the survivors, into new homes. And only the government can change the legislation for the future. And, you know, this is going to be a big test of the new Tory leader and the new Prime Minister to step up and make good the failures of Theresa May over the last two years. Would you like to see the government making additional funding available for lease owners in these private residential blocks as well to, uh, to help them pay for other fire safety measures? Because many lease owners say they are going to bed at night uh, afraid, uh, but the cost of these additional safety measures beyond removal or modification of cladding is going to run into thousands of pounds. I don't think that's necessary. What is necessary is that the government holds these block owners to their legal duty and their obligation to make their buildings safe. That's not happened yet. It must happen now. Otherwise, I mean, I desperately don't, I desperately want this to be the last anniversary of Grenfell where survivors are still waiting for justice and we're still having to press the government for essential changes to make sure that we can say to all our people, and this is a basic duty of government, to make sure our citizens are safe. OK, um, John Healy MP, Shadow Housing Secretary, uh, thank you very much for your time today. And uh, we'll have more on this Grenfell second anniversary later in the programme at 9.25. We'll be speaking to Matt Rack, General Secretary of the Fire Brigades Union, about their Never Again campaign.
Iran says it categorically rejects U.S. claims that it was behind attacks on two oil tankers in the Gulf of Oman yesterday. The denial comes after the U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said intelligence about the type of weapons used indicated Iranian forces were involved. Speaking on state radio in the last few hours, uh, an Iranian foreign ministry spokesman said, we are in charge of maintaining security off the strait. Uh, the Strait of Hormuz he was referring to. We went on, he went on to say, we rescued the crew of those attacked tankers in the shortest possible time. And he added, U.S. Secretary of State Pompeo's accusations towards Iran are alarming. It's the second such attack on tankers using the strategically important waterway which separates Iran from the Arabian Peninsula in the last month. Crude oil prices have risen in response. Gareth Barlow has the latest. Crew members from the targeted tankers appearing on Iranian state TV. Incredible, many things that... One after another, they tell the camera they have hosted us really well. Everyone has taken care of us. A narrative Iran will be keen to promote as it denies any involvement in the attacks. A narrative strongly opposed by the United States, which has released footage it claims shows Iran's military removing a mine from the side of one of the tankers. The United States assesses that Iran is responsible for these attacks. No proxy group in the area has the resources or skill to act with this level of sophistication. Iran, however, has the weapons, the expertise, and the requisite intelligence information to pull this off. As both sides promote their version of events, Iranian state TV broadcast these images, reportedly showing a rescue boat tackling a fire on the Norwegian tanker. Wrapped in flames, one of the two vessels hit by blasts on Thursday morning, as tensions between Washington and Tehran continue to rise, following the collapse of the Iranian nuclear deal. There isn't absolute evidence at this point, but we can assume the most likely suspect, which is probably hardline elements inside Iran or those operating outside that want to make sure that there are not negotiations that are renewed between the United States and Iran. The Straits of Hormuz are critically important for the world's oil supply and also for both sides. As Iran uses the power of its press and possible political factions, America is flexing the power of its planes. Both countries say they don't want war, but both do want the upper hand. Gareth Barlow, BBC News. It's believed that one of the remaining candidates to become Conservative leader, Matt Hancock, is considering withdrawing from the race, but he and his office are yet to comment. Seven MPs made it through the first round of voting yesterday, with Boris Johnson the clear favourite. Meanwhile, Chuka Amuna, the former Labour frontbencher who helped form Change UK earlier this year, has joined the Liberal Democrats. Let's uh, get a roundup of all of this uh, political news with our political correspondent Chris Mason. Morning to you, Chris. First of all, to what Matt Hancock may or may not do. What's the thinking behind the idea that he might possibly withdraw? And what, uh, what would that change about the race, do you think? Yeah, morning, Anita. The thinking boils down to he is concluding he hasn't got hope in heck of winning. That's the bottom line. He is mulling over, pulling out. We shouldn't be surprised if he does do that. There's a deadline at lunchtime for candidates that want to go round, go through to the second round of voting to, to say that that's what they want to do. So there's something of a window this morning where Mr Hancock can uh, decide to discreetly reverse out of this contest. Um, he got, what was it, 20 votes uh, yesterday, uh, finished sixth. Uh, Boris Johnson getting 114. I think Mr Hancock's probably concluded that um, it might be a struggle to get over the line next week where you'd have to get 33 votes to go ahead to the third round and therefore perhaps best to volunteer defeat rather than the arithmetic forcing it upon you uh, in a couple of days' time. What's going on amongst the also-rans, because quite frankly all of the other candidates other than Boris Johnson were also-rans uh, yesterday when you look at the numbers, is to try and work out how to respond to how well Mr Johnson has done. Now, clearly, they're not all on the same side, those who came second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh, because they all believe they have their own vision for becoming prime minister that is better than the next person's. Uh, but there's lots of conversations uh, going on and a desire, I think, amongst some uh, that the contest whittles itself down pretty quickly. And I think it's pretty likely now uh, that by uh, lunchtime, a list that did number 10 and then numbered 7 uh, will number 6.
Let's uh, talk then, Chris, about uh, the pressure that's been put on Boris Johnson or whether he's feeling significant pressure from the other remain remaining candidates to uh, take part in televised debates. Uh, how worried do you think he and his team are about, A, whether he does take part and, B, what the implications could be uh, if, if he doesn't take part? It's a big strategic decision, this, because what's very striking about Boris Johnson's campaign this time versus how it looked three years ago when he had that brief aborted attempt to take over from uh, David Cameron is they are disciplined, they are organised and they are cautious. Uh, and it's that caution that is informing their reluctance at the moment to definitively commit to taking part in these TV debates. But there's a danger in not taking part because critics are already saying, look, this is a contest where a vanishingly small proportion of the electorate get a say, fewer than 200,000 members of the Conservative Party in a country of 65 million people. And if the eventual winner squirrels themselves away and doesn't subject themselves to scrutiny, then it'll give a bigger voice to those critics who say, that the new Prime Minister, if it is Mr Johnson, uh, doesn't have a mandate and doesn't have legitimacy. Now, all of the other candidates have signed a joint statement saying they are going to take part in this Channel 4 hustings debate that's going to be broadcast on Sunday evening. Uh, amongst them, one of the contenders, uh, the International Development Secretary, Rory Stewart. He is by far the front-runner in this race. He's going to be the person in the final two. And the real judgment the members of parliament have to make is who do they want going up against Boris in the final two. And there's only one way they can judge that, which is by seeing Boris on the stage against the other candidates. Let's also talk, Chris, about Chuka Amuna. I don't know if it's some kind of record to be a member of uh, three different parties within the space of a, a few months, but he is now a Lib Dem MP. Yeah, he's made something of a habit of uh, switching sides in, in recent months. Uh, and that's what makes this newsworthy, because Westminster is such a tribal place. People have often belonged to their political parties or had an association with their political parties for longer than they've known their spouse. So that connection that people have with a political party is huge, and therefore leaving it is massive. Now, Chukra Muna left the Labour Party a few months ago and then there was Change UK which performed pretty atrociously in the European Parliament elections and then there was a peel away from some of them uh, from Change UK. Chuck Ramuna now signing up with the Liberal Democrats. He'll hold an event with Sir Vince Cable, the outgoing Lib Dem leader, at uh, lunchtime uh, today. Uh, what Mr Ramuna has concluded, he says, is that he was wrong to believe, as he did a few months ago, that there was a desperate yearning amongst the electorate for a new political party. He says he now recognises that uh, the structures and infrastructure of political parties are important, and if you set up a new outfit, you don't have that, and that political brands matter, that voters have an attachment to existing political brands, that they have some sense of what they stand for. So for those reasons, uh, Mr Amuna is signing up with the Liberal Democrats and becomes their, their 12th Member of Parliament. Okay, Chris, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Chris Mason there in Westminster for us. And uh, let's just return to that subject of televised debates involving the remaining leadership contenders for the Conservative Party, of course, the person who will also become uh, our next prime minister. And uh, in the last short while, uh, the leadership contender and cabinet minister, Michael Gove, has also been talking about this subject. Uh, he said he was delighted to be through to the next round and is looking forward to debating his colleagues in the coming days. Good I'm, I'm looking forward to the next round in the contest. I'm very pleased to have had uh, the support from my parliamentary colleagues and from the public in such numbers. Um, and I'm looking forward to a contest of ideas and to exchanging thoughts with other candidates about how we can make this country better in the future. Do you think Mr Johnson should take part in this Michael Gove, it's uh, 19 minutes past nine. The headlines on BBC News at nine. Two years on from the Grenfell Tower fire, survivors and relatives of the 72 dead come together today to remember the tragedy. One of the Conservative leadership candidates, Matt Hancock, is considering quitting the contest as Boris... ...for you at 9.40. I'll see you then. Mike, thank you very much. See you soon. Hundreds of passengers have been rescued from a train in Northamptonshire overnight after a landslide caused by heavy rain blocked the tracks. Up to 20 flood warnings are in place across England and Wales. And in Lincolnshire, RAF helicopter crews worked through the night to repair a river which had burst its banks. 
One of the country's, one of the county's top police officers described the situation as one of the most challenging emergencies he's ever seen. Charlotte Simpson reports. Passengers finally led to safety after almost eight hours stranded on the tracks. Emergency services worked late into the night to rescue around 500 people on board this East Midlands train from Nottingham to London. The trouble began when the 1434 service was derailed by a landslide near Corby in Northamptonshire. A second train, which came to rescue them, then also got trapped by flood water. They did have about 25, 30 uh, network rail staff trying to dig through the landslide to make sure the ballast on the track was safe and we could go through. But in the end, they made the safety decision to say, no, we're going to take you off the train. In Lincolnshire, the RAF has been working throughout the night after the river steeping broke its banks, causing severe flooding in the village of Wainfleet. The town received more than two months' rain in just two days, forcing over 100 people to leave their homes. Lincolnshire police described it as one of the most challenging emergencies the county has faced in recent times. Elsewhere, downpours continued to cause disruption in North Wales, where the River Allen burst its banks on Wednesday while parts of Shropshire have seen 16 inches of rainfall. Despite the heavy rain, the Met Office says this month still has some way to go before it overtakes the UK's wettest ever June, when 149 millimetres of rain fell in 2012. The Environment Agency has issued up to 20 flood warnings across England and Wales, with more wet weather forecast for today. Charlotte Simpson, BBC News. The man accused of carrying out the terror attacks in Christchurch in New Zealand has pleaded not guilty to all 92 charges against him. Brenton Harrison Tarrant appeared by video link at the High Court in the city. He denied 51 charges of murder, 40 charges of attempted murder and one charge of terrorism. Donald Trump has announced that his press secretary, Sarah Sanders, will leave her role at the end of this month. Ms. Sanders has been a fierce defender of the president. She also broke with decades of tradition by abandoning the Daily White House press briefing. Mr. Trump said she'd done an incredible job. Her replacement is yet to be announced. I'll try not to get emotional um, because I know that crying can make us look weak sometimes, right? <laughs> Uh, this has been the honor of a lifetime, the opportunity of a lifetime. Uh, I couldn't be prouder to have had the opportunity to serve my country and particularly to work for this president. Sarah Sanders. A ban on adverts featuring harmful or offensive gender stereotypes has come into force today. The UK's advertising watchdog says inaccurate preconceptions about gender shouldn't be reinforced in advertising. Lisa Mazimba has more. So easy, a man can do it. It's phrases like this. Stereotypes like this. Girls doing ballet while boys do maths. And offensive preconceptions. Women unable to handle DIY tasks that could well find themselves in trouble. Women, don't expect any help on a Thursday. Print and online are covered too. So ads like this, think like a man if you want to be a boss. All this, are you beach body ready, will be under the spotlight. The ASA wants to prevent stereotypes that pressurise women and men. Let's return now to our top story today. Two years after the Grenfell Tower fire which killed 72 people, three quarters of tall buildings with cladding categorised as unsafe still haven't had it removed or modified. While the Fire Brigades Union is launching a campaign today calling for urgent action on a range of fire and building safety issues to prevent another Grenfell tragedy, we can now speak to Matt Rack, who's General Secretary of the FBU. He joins me from our central London newsroom. Uh, Matt, thank you very much for coming along to talk to us today. And, and tell us, first of all, about this Grenfell Never Again campaign. That's the name of it. Uh, what uh, do you want to see happen? Well, we've been campaigning around Grenfell uh, since the fire uh, on, on many fronts and this has been uh, launched today because of, in our view, the failure of central government to take serious action. Your, your introduction there explained that we still have hundreds of buildings with the same cladding as was in place at Grenfell that, caught, that uh, contributed to such a devastating fire. 
We also have other forms of cladding which are flammable. People will recall the, the, the appalling fire just last weekend in Barking uh, in a block of flats. Completely different uh, system, completely different cladding, but nevertheless fire safety not being taken seriously. We also have uh, evidence from across the country that there are other fire safety failings in buildings up and down the, up and down the country. Uh, we know at Grenfell that cladding was a key issue, but there were other major fire safety failings, such as fire doors that didn't uh, work, windows ill-fitted, uh, Ill uh, smoke extraction system that didn't work, and so on. Uh, and we're finding that this is common in buildings across the country. It's, it's appalling. It's, some of this has been highlighted as a result of inspections that have taken place after Grenfell. And we believe that the action to address it is far too slow uh, and not sufficient. So we've set out a series of, of calls, such as the removal of cladding, such as the uh, investment to allow us, the fire service to undertake inspections and to train up and to, to re reverse the loss of specialist fire safety officers, listening to tenants, clearly a factor that was in, seems to have been a key factor in ignoring people at Grenville and also in the Barking Fire. The people living in tower blocks are being ignored by their landlords or by the building owners. The whole that system is, is appalling. Is there two years on any reasonable or logical reason why work hasn't started on so many buildings as we've outlined today? It's, I'm sure a key factor in that is cost that we were given all sorts of promises, not just the fire service, but uh, particularly residents and tenants in, uh, in blocks of flats. We're given all sorts of promises by politicians at the start that everything would be done to address this. The, the, the pace of change is painstakingly slow and utterly insufficient. And what, while, that, uh, while those measures aren't addressed, then people still uh, have those fears and we still have those fears. Of course, many members of your union uh, were at Grenfell uh, two years ago. H how are they recovering? Because clearly for the first respond responders, uh, the, the trauma was significant. Well, I think people react in very many different ways. I'm aware of people who, who some people I think are very seriously affected by the fire. I think other people don't want to talk about it and that's understandable. It was probably the worst night of their lives. Other people, I think, are very angry uh, and want to see the sort of changes that we're trying to highlight today. So it, it will affect, and I think, unfortunately, as uh, not just for firefighters, but for, for the, the community, the pain of this and the impact on it on people's uh, health and well-being will go on for a, a very long time. So it affects people in very many different ways. OK. Uh, Matt Rack, General Secretary of the Fire Brigades Union, thank you very much. Uh, the time is almost half past nine. In a moment, we'll have a look at the weather forecast. But first, here's Joanna Gosling uh, with what she's got coming up on the Victoria Derbyshire programme at 10. Good morning. Two years on from the Grenfell disaster that claimed the lives of 72 people, some families say they're still waiting to be rehoused. We'll talk to some of those affected. Also on the programme, the mother of a severely autistic son who fears he may be made homeless from today because his complex needs are not being met. Join us at 10 on BBC Two, the BBC News Channel and online. We'll see Joanna at 10. OK, let's look at the weather forecast. Matt Taylor's got the latest for us. Hi, Matt. The, the rain causing so many problems in many different uh, parts of the country. Any respite in sight? I have a little bit in the way of better news, Anita. There will be a bit more sunshine across the UK today. The rain will be easing off. Still thoroughly wet, though, out there at the moment across some parts of the UK. Let me just show you the radar chart. Yes, the rain in the Hebrides may be welcome, but it's across parts of England and Wales where it's still raining at the moment. This is in areas that have seen close to three months' worth of rainfall in the past seven days. The rain, though, is easing off in intensity. Notice how that area of persistent rain pushes out into the northern North Sea. Could just clip Aberdeenshire later, but in its wake, we'll start to see the skies brighten a better chance of some sunnier spells. Not going to be completely dry by any means. Still a few heavy showers. Maybe a rumble of thunder with uh, those that we see across England and Wales. Particularly uh, thundery, those showers you see across Northern Ireland and only a few for Scotland. So more of you will spend the bulk of the time dry through this afternoon with a better chance of sunshine, feeling warmer too. Into tonight, some clear skies for a while. More rain pushes into the west into the morning to produce a wet start for western areas on uh, Saturday morning before turning to sunshine and showers. Eastern airs start bright, showers later. And really, it's a sunshine and shower week. Weekend, but compared to the week so far, it's looking a little bit drier than it has been. Bye for now.
Hello, good morning. This is BBC News at Nine with me, Anita McVeigh. The headlines. Two years on from the Grenfell Tower fire, survivors and relatives of the 72 dead come together today to remember the tragedy. It's very hard to believe that it's happened. Um, even though you know and you've seen death certificates and everything else, it's, you find it very hard to accept. The latest figures show that hundreds of high-rise buildings still have cladding similar to the type used on Grenfell Tower. One of the Conservative leadership candidates, Matt Hancock, is considering quitting the contest as Boris Johnson's rivals put pressure on Hundreds of passengers are rescued from a train overnight after heavy rain caused a landslide and widespread flooding in Northamptonshire. Time now for the morning briefing where we bring you up to the speed up to speed on the stories people are watching, reading and sharing. And we'll begin with the second anniversary of the Grenfell fire, uh, which has been dominating today's news agenda. The Today programme has been hearing from the Bishop of Kensington, who's written a report called The Social Legacy of Grenfell, and also from the chief executive of Almanar Mosque, which was a central source of emergency support on the night of the fire. We've got some way to go. Uh, I feel uh, two years later, um, we haven't really addressed the uh, real issues uh, that uh, led to the inadequacies that we witnessed during uh, the fire and afterwards. Um, we were expecting uh, evaluation reports to have been conducted uh, throughout the last two years, especially by the statutory sector, the local authority, the NHS and others. Unfortunately, so far, as we've seen from Bishop Graham's uh, report and uh, earlier from Muslim Aid and uh, uh, Theos, uh, these are the uh, non-state uh, uh, civil society organizations that have taken again the initiative uh, for the second time to evaluate and assess uh, what went wrong and what could have been done better. Um, without uh, this kind of uh, assessment, I think uh, the recovery process itself uh, will be very much ineffective and it will not address the healing process as quickly effect and effectively as possible. Bishop, do you agree? I do. I think we've got uh, quite a long way to go in this. I think there are the short-term issues, which we just heard about, the cladding questions around the country, which are exercising a lot of people in the local area of North Kensington because they know what happened to them, could happen to others as well. And because they know that if it's not done, or they sense that if it is not done in a timely manner, it is in a sense a, a, a commentary on how they are being treated exactly. and, and, and regarded. And that's why one of the reasons why I think there's... Um, ongoing frustration in the local area. But I think there are, as uh, Abdurrahman says, these deeper social issues. I remember at the time of the, the fire, it wasn't just about fire safety and building regulations. There were all kinds of other social questions being asked at the time. And perhaps we've lost sight of some of those. And one of the reasons why I wrote this report was to try to draw attention to some of the bigger, deeper social questions that Grenfell raises. Like what? Like the way we do local democracy. One of the stories, I think, that came out of Grenfell, one of the... Um, the uh, things that I heard during the conversations that led up to this report was a deep sense of a community that didn't feel listened to or, or understood. And we haven't quite got right this sense of local people feeling able to have a say in the decisions that affect them. And civil society works best when people feel they have a stake and a say in the issues that really affect their lives. And we haven't quite got that right at the moment. Uh, the Right Reverend Dr Graham Tomlin and uh, Abdurrahman Saeed there. Boris Johnson is under mounting pressure to debate in televised Tory leadership hustings as criticism of his near blackout on public speaking grows. One of his rivals in the race for the leadership, Rory Stewart, has been telling the Today programme why it's so important that Boris Johnson appears. He is by far the front runner in this race. He's going to be the person in the final two and the real judgment the members of parliament have to make is who do they want going up against Boris in the final two? And there's only one way they can judge that, which is by seeing Boris on the stage against the other candidates. It, what does it say about him if he doesn't turn up? Well, I think it shows that he... Uh, well, I, sorry, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to be too personal about this, but it feels as though he is feels that he's doing well, that he's winning, and that he doesn't want to take any risk which could upset the campaign. But I think it's a great pity. He's a great public performer. The public uh, need to see him. And I think it's also really important for the legitimacy of the choice of the Prime Minister that this doesn't take place in a smoke-filled room, but that the public 
is able to see the candidates out in public. And in fact, I think maybe it's a lesson from the last leadership race that we need to test the candidates on television, in front of the public, with rigorous questioning before they become prime minister. What questions has he not answered that he should know? Well, there are a number of questions I've asked which I haven't had an answer to. Uh, one of them is about the question of whether or not he'll say that he would never suspend Parliament. I'd also like some clarity from him and indeed from other candidates on whether they will meet the Chancellor's fiscal rules on debt and borrowing. I'm an economic conservative and I think it's very, very important for our party that we are fiscally prudent. That's important to our brand. It's going to be particularly important after Brexit. But the most important question of all for Boris and indeed for some of the other candidates is what is this no-deal Brexit and how are they going to do it? The how he keeps saying he will deliver Brexit by the 31st of October, but how? We need to get into the details of how it's going to happen. How is he going to renegotiate with Europe? How is he going to get it through Parliament? Because this can't just be a blind act of uh, faith. Jeremy Hunt came second, quite, quite a long way back, but he came second. It is possible, isn't it, that people do rally round. We're hearing that Matt Hancock's um, uh, considering pulling out, that people do rally round and that he is the eventual uh, second-place candidate. Does he have what it takes, do you think, to... Um, uh, stop Boris Johnson if it comes to that. One way of seeing that is going to be these television debates. I think it's going to be critical because Boris is one of the greatest communicators in modern British political life. So the question is going to be which one of us has the flair, the nimbleness, uh, the minds and the communication ability to be able to challenge this formidable campaigner. Uh, and do you think Jeremy Hunt does potentially? I don't know. I think he's somebody who's been a very, very distinguished cabinet minister, but, but let's see on Sunday. Rory Stewart. Chuka Amuna has said he massively underestimated how difficult it is to set up a new party without existing infrastructure after he left the Labour Party to help set up Change UK. He's been telling the Today programme he thinks there isn't room for more than one centre ground party and he's been explaining why he's taken the decision to join the Lib Dems. Look, I'm a social democrat with liberal values. I believe in a free and fair society, a mixed economy that is fair to all. Um, and I'm unapologetically an internationalist, which is why I think we need to stay in the European Union. Those but you've are been very critical values. of the liberal democrats in the past. You said you could never right. forgive them for enabling Tory austerity. Well, the thing that has given me pause for thought definitely has been the time that the liberal democrats served in coalition and um, the austerity. Um, but things have changed since then. The Liberal Democrats have voted against every single Conservative budget since 2015. They stood on a anti-austerity 2017 manifesto saying that they would do things like reversing housing benefit and universal credit cuts. And look, if you want to end austerity, you cannot do that if you are going to sponsor Brexit in the way that the two main parties are doing. And the Liberal Democrats have been clear about this from the very start, that so they not only want a people's vote, but to remain in the European Union, and that's absolutely fundamental. But look, uh, so what happened to the to the bright new dawn of change? UK? Well, I would say um, there are two things that I've learned from the last uh, few months. I think, first of all, I massively underestimated just how difficult it is to set up a fully fledged new party without an existing infrastructure. That proved impossible to do. And of course, the Liberal Democrats are an existing centre ground party. Uh, sen uh, secondly, it's quite clear that there isn't room for more than one centre ground option, particularly under first past the post um, in UK politics. And I think I, I thought that the millions of politically homeless people in the radical centre ground of British politics, the loads listening to this programme, wanted a new party. Uh, and I was wrong about that. What people actually wanted us to do, and I heard this time and time again during the European and local elections, is to actually work together in the centre ground with existing forces to build the strongest possible vehicle to take our politics forward. So, so either you ignore what people are saying and what the voters are saying, or you actually take heed of that, hold your hands up if you've got something wrong, and say, look, this is a way forward, and I think this is what people want us to do. So do you think there will be other MPs uh, from different parties, either from Change UK or from actually within the Labour Party, who will now decide to join the Liberal Democrats? Well, look, we're at a historic juncture in our politics. Uh, our two-party politics is broken. You've got an opposition and government who are failing to perform their uh, constitutional duties in the right way. And I think the British people are up for upending that two-party system in a way that I haven't seen in my lifetime. And I think there are lots of people 
in the two main parties who know that. They know that their parties are broken and they know they're dysfunctional and this But broken not lots first of people party. who are prepared to defect, surely. Well, I could see certainly a number of MPs, both in the Conservative and the Labour parties, who are prepared to do that. How many I also you say, think, roughly? Um, I'd say a, a good handful. Look, leaving a political party is a huge thing. It isn't just about your politics, it's about your identity. People have family connections and social connections in those parties as well. It's a very, very difficult decision. And but can just look opportunistic. I... Sorry? Can just look opportunistic. Well, I think, I mean, I, I do find this thing bemusing because ultimately if what you're concerned about is your career and political security, you don't leave one of the main parties. If you do, you are literally putting everything on the line. And the reason that I left the Labour Party was because I put my values and my principles and what I believe in and what's best for my community before absolutely everything else. And if that means at some point I cease to be a member of, of Parliament, so be it. And that's what you've got to be prepared to do. And I think that's what the public want you to do. And that's why ultimately I've chosen to join the Liberal Democrats, because I think they are going to be, and they are, spearheading a renewed centre ground, internationalist and um, social democratic and liberal offer in this country. And if that's what you want, join as well. That's what I would say. Chuka Amuna. One of the most watched items on the BBC online page today features the actor Keanu Reeves, one of the latest Hollywood superstars to lend his voice, face and performance to a video game character. And he's been insisting gaming doesn't need legitimising. The star plays Johnny Silverhand in Cyberpunk 2077. Keanu Reeves. And in fact, if you look at the BBC News app, you'll see that that story, uh, Keanu Reeves, games don't lead, need legitimising, is number one, in fact, on the most watched. Uh, just scrolling back up to uh, the most read, number one there is a story about a calendar firm. Uh, and if you look, they've got a photograph of one of their calendars with the words Bad May written across. This is because uh, the government has decided to move next year's early uh, May bank holiday from Monday the 4th to Friday the 8th to mark VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. But with um, you know 400,000 of its calendars already printed uh, for next year, this firm, Allen & Bertram, say this is going to cost them uh, £200,000. And there's a quote uh, from the manager uh, saying it had probably been the single most stressful week that I have ever faced in business. We're totally in agreement with changing the date, just not changing it with 11 months notice when you've had 74 years to prepare for this event. And then um, let's just look at one other story on the most watched. Um, this involves the Harry Potter star, uh, Bonnie Wright, who played Ginny Weasley, as many of you may know, um, joining in the uh, campaign to think about plastic, how we use it, whether we need it in certain circumstances. And uh, in this case, she's thinking about toys. And uh, this is uh, a campaign that she's done um, in a special report for BBC Radio 5 Live. So she goes along to a school and asks uh, children there to think about whether they can upcycle their plastic toys, etc. You know, never too young to start thinking about this subject. So uh, a really interesting watch there involving um, the actress and uh, Greenpeace activist uh, Bonnie Wright. And that's it for today's morning briefing. OK, let's uh, catch up with sport. Let's get a roundup from the BBC Sports Centre with Mike Bushell and uh, who will be there. There you are. <laughs> <I'm here. laughs> and uh, more action today in the Women's World Cup from England and Scotland, Mike. Yeah, three matches in all. But yes, a big day ahead, as you say, Anita. Thanks very much in the Women's World Cup for both Scotland, first of all, and later on England. Scotland. A nationwide women's strike takes place in Switzerland today with demonstrations across the country. Marches were held 28 years ago for pay equality, but campaigners say little has changed and that discrimination in the workplace still exists. Imogen Folks reports from Bern. June 14, 1991. Half a million Swiss women took to the streets to protest against inequality. They had no right to maternity leave and not a single woman in the Swiss government. Dore Heim was there. 1991 was a real big bang. I think it was like a wake-up call for our politics. And since then, we have achieved a lot. We have more women being politicians. We have more laws for women, for example, paid maternity leave. So that day, almost 30 years ago, did achieve some things. But for a century, Swiss women have complained that equality is moving at a snail's pace. They didn't even get the vote until 1971. Today, combining work and family remains a huge challenge. 
Swiss women earn an average 20% less than men. For pensions, the gap is 37%. That's why women not even born in the last strike are preparing for another one and hoping for change. There are so many things I wish could be achieved after this strike. Um, one is like equal pay for equal work, less discrimination at the workplace and also in everyday life just because of your gender. Hundreds of thousands of women are expected out on the streets for the strike and Swiss employers are taking a relaxed attitude. No one's expected to be penalised for leaving work. The question really is, what will change in the long term, especially around that pay gap? Imogen Folks, BBC News, Bern. The time is 9.55, just before we uh, go to the weather forecast. This weekend, France's most famous orangutan turns 50. Uh, this is Nanette. She arrived at uh, the zoo in Paris in 1972 when she was just three years old. Uh, she loves painting and drawing and, in fact, her artwork has sold for thousands of pounds. She creates art several times a week, sometimes using paper and uh, sometimes painting on the glass which separates her from visitors. Uh, we're told that she'll have a party on Sunday and uh, will even enjoy a slice of animal-friendly birthday cake. OK, let's uh, check out that weather forecast and see if there's any sign of the rain stopping. Here's Simon King. Hi, Simon. Yeah, something many of us have been uh, waiting to happen. The rain is going to eventually clear away today and it's going to become drier, not completely dry, but drier. That's the picture this morning. You can see for England and Wales, it's been a very solid.